Welcome to our interview with Constance Natasha Mosier. We're going to talk about her book, Thoughts of an Ordinary Woman. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you for having me. What was the beginning of this book? The beginning of this book started in, I can be actually very specific, it was June 3rd, 2000. And I was just waking up from sleep and you know that state that you're in where you're, you're out of dream state, but you're not quite awake. Not quite fully awake. Yeah. Exactly. And I sat on the edge of the bed, and it was, it was as if somebody had whispered these words to me. And out came my mouth. I said, I am going to write a book, and it is called Thoughts of an Ordinary Woman. And I said that, and then I just kind of turned around like, who just said that? <laughs> Wow. But it was that powerful. I had no idea how it was going to be put together. I just knew in all of me that someday I would write this book. It was like a, a calling, maybe, to Absolutely. speak to what is, what is the life experience of so-called ordinary woman, which <laughs> we'll get into. Now, while you're here today, I want to invite you, if you're willing, to maybe read a couple of the pieces. I'd be happy to. And so. Is there one that speaks to how this, how this came about? You know, actually the very first thought, which will be somewhat re repetitive of, of what I just said, but the first thought is called The Beginning, and it's dated June 3rd, 2000. All of the thoughts in the book are really passages, and to many are read as journals. Okay. And it says, when I woke up today, I sat on the edge of my bed in a trance light state. I felt like someone or something had just whispered a profound yet strange message in my ear right before I woke. I turned to my husband John and said confidently, I am going to write a book and it is called Thoughts of an Ordinary Woman. Tell us about your journey writing this book. So from the moment that this came to you to when you actually published, what were the steps and what was your process? <sighs> You know, this, um, this book is a collection of eight years worth of that journey. And it really is a journey of a time for me where leading up to that morning of sitting on the edge of the bed, my career had been very successful by the accounts of many. I had had many promotions at a young age. Uh, I was making a very good wage. I was being relocated from, with companies mm -hmm. um, to share my talents in new corporations. Mm -hmm. And um, by all those accounts, I was doing really, really well. Living uh, what some might consider a very desirable life. Exactly. Right? Mm -hmm. Educationally, and you were working in major companies, sort of what we exactly. would call corporate America. Exactly, exactly. But yet I felt that there was this growing gap inside of me uh, my son was not quite a year old, mm -hmm. and that experience, which I think most ordinary parents understand, that when a child comes into your life, that you open up in different ways. Yeah. And I started to really question, what was my role in life? What, what was it that I was brought here in this life to bring to the table? I could do my business job, I could take care of my son, I could do what I needed to do with um, my husband, but I would go to bed at night just feeling empty, and that emptiness started to grow and grow. And one thing that I would turn to is my journal. Okay. And I, um, to step back in time a little bit, I discovered through that journaling that I'd really been writing since I was five years old. Oh. Now, I never thought twice about it. Did someone, when you were young, suggest that you keep a journal, a, a grandparent or a teacher or something in elementary school? Or how did you have that idea to do that? Because that can be a great comfort and 
and release and self-knowledge mm -hmm. for a person throughout their whole life, I think. Yeah, I had a lot of influencers, and uh, it might be hard to believe, but I was somewhat known as a talker in school. <laughs> and so I think my teachers and my parents got together and said, okay, we need to round her up a little bit. <laughs> I spent more time in detention for talking during class <laughs> than I did for ever getting in any sort of trouble. And so at that time, I, I can remember being in fourth grade and teacher saying, Constance, go write a story. And I wouldn't just write a one-page story. I would write 15 pages of a story I in fourth love grade. It. I love it. And then as I hit my teenage years, when you're going through lots of changes, I started to write more reflectively. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I didn't know that at the time, but it really did turn into journaling and thoughts of what I was experiencing at the time. And it was just amazing. And then as I got older, it, it, the journaling just continued, but never once until later in life when this gap and, and the mm -hmm. book hit me, did I, was I able to look back and say, oh my goodness, I've been telling my story my whole life. Yeah, like you had been preparing or on this runway but that wasn't cognizant until that moment. Exactly, exactly. Wow. All right, so you, you determined that you would continue to journal mm -hmm. and that this would become thoughts of an ordinary woman. Let's talk more. What is this concept that you have of the ordinary woman? Well, you know, I, I am a big believer that there is nothing ordinary about life. Nothing that we experience is ordinary. What makes it ordinary is our belief that because so many other people experience the same things, mm -hmm. that's what makes it ordinary. But I'll tell you something, Lori, there is nothing ordinary about the millions of people that have had to see a family member suffer through cancer. Yeah. That is a unique, extraordinary experience yeah for each individual. Yeah. Or every time a mother gives birth and a father sees a, a new child come into life, yeah. that is an extraordinary experience. Yes. And yet, we can be around the water cooler and say, oh yeah, so-and-so had a baby. Right, yeah. But when you really step back and you reflect on the miracles of life, I've said that um, a miracle to me, I've changed my definitions around miracles. Miracles used to be the child that almost got hit by a train and was somehow saved and nobody saw how it was saved, but it was saved. Yeah. That used to be a miracle yeah. to me. Yeah. The miracles I experience today sometimes are just getting out of bed. Oh, yes. Just getting that out resonates. of bed. And being what? able to work through whatever it is. Maybe it's a fear of success. Maybe it's a fear of failure. Maybe it's you don't feel good, mm -hmm. but you got to do it anyway. Those are the daily miracles that I am seeing everywhere now that my eyes have opened up to. Every experience is extraordinary. So it's as if you've tapped into a, a purpose, which is to, I, I guess I, I agree, to appropriately elevate what people are inclined to make common mm -hmm. or commonplace. Would you like to pick something else that you can read to us right now? Sure. I know you've got some of the pieces I love your book, by the way. I read the whole thing. Thank some you. are poetic, mm -hmm. some are more like essays. And I know a strong theme that you have is taking time, which all of us should do, many of us do, to, to be in nature and to be very connected to what's going on in our environment, our mm -hmm. surroundings. Go ahead. That is actually a perfect segue into the one that I want to read okay. now. Uh, this is called Time to Replant, and it was written March 29th, 2002, and I was living in the Denver, Colorado area, so I had the beautiful Rocky Mountains mm -hmm. behind me and amazing sunrises and sunsets. The sunset tonight was a gift from the heavens. It wore a bright pink sweater with a violet center. The clouds danced in their mysticism, and the mountains stood tall and clear in the distance. As I turned away from the diminishing colors, I thought this gift was over, only to find a worldly-sized harvest moon to my front. The golden colors remind me of the riches of the universe still unknown to us. It is a sunset like tonight that centers me, 
and a moon that proves we can still be surprised by nature. The trick is recognizing it. Our daily routines, headaches, stresses, and preoccupations make it difficult for us to see the gifts right in front of us. We've all heard that we need to stop and smell the roses. This is true and yet very difficult to do. It's even more unimaginable to stop and turn the soil, plant a seed, cover the seedling, water it, keep an eye on it to make sure it's growing, watch it as it bursts through the ground reaching for sunlight, seeing one day a blossom appearing, and over days it starts to turn larger and larger until it thrusts itself toward heaven with petals full of life, perseverance, and fragrance. And then we kneel before its determination and cradle it, gently taking its softness and smell, and remember how something so simple as smelling a rose replants us firmly in the soil of our own life. What replants you? Writing is my true passion as a means to help others. At the same time, some things that center us also decenter us. My son is a great example. There are days like this past Sunday that he warms me from head to toe and awakens my nurturer side. Then there are days like yesterday that he tested me so badly that I just wanted to lock him or me in a room far away. This is normal and very much to be expected. The same rose I wrote about also has thorns. Someday it may make you bleed and you'll change the way you feel about it for a moment. It's not enough to enjoy and love the things that make you happy. The true test is still believing in their love for you during the times that their love hurts. Wow, that is beautiful. Thank you. And I, I'm sitting here thinking what courage you have <laughs> to share your observations and your wisdom in, in the form of you. This is, this is you, it's by you, it's from you. Mm -hmm. Another creative writer might elect to bake these themes into a character in a novel. Right. So I, I would be curious to know, with your book out there, what have been some of the responses and reactions that you've gotten from people? I would think, especially people that know you in your day job, walk <laughs> of life, would maybe just be sort of awed or, or bowled over, if you will, to, to encounter such a depth of feeling and reflection as you have. So what have been some reactions that you get from people, from readers? You know, I, I can really sum this up to saying that it's all about vulnerability. And yeah. trust me, I have thought about that many, many times and have had what I call the gremlins in my head. <laughs> around, are you crazy, yeah, Constance? Yeah, keep, keep this in a drawer. Keep this in a drawer. There's a lot of writers that are watching right now, I bet, would-be writers, <laughs> and it's in a drawer or it's in a closet. Yeah. yeah, because you're right. In the morning, I'd put my suit on, and I would go to my corporate job, and there is a different hat that you have to wear. Now, I make a strong point because of my beliefs and my values to bring as much of me as I possibly can to work. Yeah. But the responses that I saw were fortunately very surprising. I was nervous as all get out. But person after person, and usually on an individual basis, not in group settings, yeah. would pull me aside or call me and email me and say, thank you so much for putting this out there. This particular thought is me. I felt like you were talking about me and I have not been able to share it with anyone. I am incredibly vulnerable in this book. This is, uh, these are experiences of relationships, of parenting, of career, and health, mm -hmm. and its successes and its failures, and I mm -hmm. put it right out there. It's a very risky proposition for a lot of people that are still living, if you will, between two worlds of their passion and the day job. Yeah, what, what they feel they must do. Right. What they should do. How they should speak or the, Correct. the depth or, as you say, vulnerability that, that is appropriate to. Yeah. But I will they. tell you that even with the few hints 
of, oh my goodness, I can't believe she did that. I would have never done that. Mm -hmm. It is more an overwhelming response from new people, from friends that are so grateful and thankful that I know that I am doing exactly what I was brought here to do. And nothing can change that for me. Nothing wilts that. Yeah. Yeah, I just thought of, I, I don't know if this is a word or not, but I, I feel like you're a de-isolationist, <laughs> right? Um, I bought a couple copies of your book, one I shared with my cousin, mm. and she has three boys, including two have been in the military, yes. one is in a civilian role now, but one is still uh, deployed, active duty. Okay. And I just remember, your book and some of the pieces hit her really well, really strongly of feeling like I'm not alone. There's another woman who has had these types of experiences and it was just such a blessing to her to, to feel that connectedness. Yeah. Yeah. And I will say too that while women tend to relate, or I know maybe not relate more, but they share more of their experiences yeah. and maybe buy my book a little bit more. The men who have read the book equally relate. These are experiences that we all can relate to. Again, that so-called ordinary. Mm -hmm. We've all been through it. It's, it's almost like fill in, fill in the space where your name goes mm -hmm. and this experience can be yours and know you are not alone. Yeah, yeah. Well, this opens the door for me anyway, to, I, I would like to know your thoughts. feels like we're in such a fast-paced society and I'm, I get so overwhelmed with all of the electronics mm -hmm. and kind of the requirements that we're, we are so plugged in mm -hmm. and emails and things like that. Do you have any people that have responded in that way? Like, wow, I, I, I felt anyway reading your book, it was a real encouragement to get out and take a walk. Mm -hmm. To unplug, what do you think? Can I read a, th a, oh, read yes. a thought? Oh, yes, yes. This one is called Rain Quest, huh. another nature one. I have found that some of my best writing, even today, is done because I'm grounded in nature. It might be my front yard, it might be the mountains. but <laughs> exactly. So this was written, again, when I was living in Colorado, and this was a time when there were grave fires in the mountains. People were losing their homes, people were getting very sick because the smoke was pouring into Denver and asthma, there were alerts. It was a real critical time and you could from the city see flames coming up over some of the ridges which was I believe the first time that had ever really been experienced. Mm -hmm. So this was August 5th, 2002 and I was sitting on my patio and it was the first day in almost three weeks that it had shown signs that it was going to rain. The rain has been short in coming lately. The clouds sparse and the thunder silent. The skin dry and the smell in the air dismal. I have heard many speak of praying for the rain, I being one of them. And yet the rain has not come. The fires in the mountains continue and the everyday trees wilt. Some say it is unfair punishment, while others say our dues have been set forth. Is it the rain we seek, or is it the acknowledgement of our prayers? The world I see is searching for both. Maybe the rain does not come because the angels have slowed their tears. My fear is that when the rain does come, we will feel it was expected and not be thankful. We must find a way to show Mother Nature Thanksgiving. For Mother Nature sits on the high council of God. Just as the Native Americans celebrated her presence with dance, we must learn to cherish her fruit, even when it is not present. The rain is now upon us. After days of waiting and praying, and yet I wonder how many of us will continue to pray. I ask only that my quest be one of prayer when I am surrounded by the rain, and one of cherishment when I am not. Oh, very nice. 
For you now, living in the Twin Cities area, where are some of your favorite places to get inspired and do your writing? I am very blessed in that I live in the most adorable little cottage house in Minnetonka. I have a half acre and full of trees, a pond, and I have three animals that I love dearly. Mm -hmm. So my front yard, side yards, backyard, and the pond are where I spend most of my time and do a lot of my writing. And even if the weather doesn't permit going outside, I sit next to one of my windows mm -hmm. and write. And I am just constantly inspired by all the wildlife that is around and, and just the seasons. Yeah, I feel like we're speaking to a theme that we're, we're seeing emerge more and more over the last, I think, eight to 12 years on wellness. What mm. does that mean in our fast-paced, highly developed Western culture where you know people are so quick to take prescription medicines, mm -hmm. you know, just to, again, have this hectic lifestyle, big houses, lots of vehicles. What are your thoughts on that? How do you define wellness? That is a great question. Um, honestly, I struggle with it, too. I have my days just like anybody else, and there's days where I feel like I'm absolutely on top of it. Um, I have had health challenges, and I, I put them in quotes because, again, I have found that those health challenges are extraordinary events yeah. that help me say, Constance, where are you at? Yeah. What needs to change? Yeah. What is out of yeah. balance? Yeah. So I think wellness needs to be personally prescribed. Ooh. What is it in your life that brings you pleasure? For some people, it could be as simple as a glass of wine on their deck, mm -hmm. and other people, it could be a 25-mile bike ride. Mm -hmm or just laying next to their baby in bed, watching it move and, and woo. Yeah. And there's, there's, there's nothing to define that for you but what you know to be true within you. Yeah. And for me, my home is by far a place of great pleasure for me and great wisdom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it seems as though you, know, you are living a more integrated model of we all want to in our day and age and being raised in a developed world have access to the very best high technology healthcare mm -hmm. solutions when and if we need those right but if it can be integrated with walks and nature and finding sanctuary somewhere mm -hmm. i feel is also a very resonant theme mm -hmm. in your book Absolutely. Is creating and finding your own sanctuary. And getting in touch mm -hmm. through journaling, mm -hmm. through talking out loud. Mm -hmm. We have the wisdom that we need within us to accomplish and do anything that we want in life. One of my favorite sayings, and I say it every day and every time I think about it, is that I can be, do, and have anything I want. And I put so much love and so much intention around that because I have times of fear. I have times of, of thinking about how do I balance a 10-hour day at work with trying to make my son's baseball game yeah. with am I going to be able to make a nutritional dinner? <laughs> right. Or is it going to be mac and cheese or <laughs> you know some frozen meal thrown in the microwave? And sometimes <laughs> I get it all right and I check my little box of good job. <laughs> and other times it's, I'm doing the best I can. And that's where back to when we originally first started mm -hmm. talking about miracles. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the miracle that you experience is finding that extra five minutes to make the salad that you didn't want to make. Yeah. And I yeah. tie all of this back to what you're asking about is health and wellness. It is self-prescribed. Some people may never journal and that is absolutely fine, but maybe they get on their bike or yeah. they put on their running shoes and the journaling happens inside of them. Getting grounded in nature is one of the most healing things a person can do. Better than any prescription drug out there, I, I, I just firmly believe that. Is there a time and a place? Absolutely, for it all. But there's so much that we can do on our own to be healthy, well, and wise. Yeah, I, I love your theme about 
it's self-prescribed, how you're going to put this together. What are your, what's your vision that you have for women? I mean, you're, you're writing about the female experience. What do you, what's, what's your vision for women, the contemporary woman right now, or a woman, let's say, that's in college that would encounter your book? What are the shifts and changes that you aspire will happen hmm. for them? I'd like to share a thought. Okay, good. Good. This is very appropriate to that theme because I think one of the greatest things that women in particular struggle with is self-acceptance and self-worth. Yes. Men do too. Yeah. They're, they're, you know, they're, not, they're not out of this equation by any means. <laughs> but us as women, yeah. we sometimes try to solve world hunger within ourselves. Before breakfast. Before breakfast and sometimes before waking. And when it's not accomplished, then we beat ourselves up. Yes. This thought is called greatness. And it was written uh, May 10th, 2003. And I was once again in the mountains, this time in Arizona, and sitting on a very big log up in the mountains, 11,000 feet up, and very grounded. It must seem very interesting to the angels and others who watch upon us to see us knowing we are destined for greatness once we choose to let go. And yet we choose to let go of that knowledge out of fear for the greatness. It is in this greatness that we find peace, because peace only comes from our relinquishment of fear. I fear a great love only because I have not experienced one. I am guaranteed for it to be greater than anything I know, and yet I choose to stay in a lesser love out of a wrongful perception that I am unworthy. God does not want us to be poor, unhealthy, misguided, or unloved. But at some point, we chose to experience thought ungoverned by his love. How great of a God we have to have let us go and yet be ready at any moment to take us back wholly. He sees us as perfect. Surely we can find a way to accept his view. <laughs> that is terrific. Still chokes me up. That is terrific. And I'll tell you, it's been a real pleasure for me to meet and spend time with someone who I do see you as being 11,000 feet up and also, <laughs> at the same time, grounded. Beautiful. How can people find your book? I have a website. Okay, good. It is called um, TheOrdinaryWoman.com. Okay. And very simple. And um, I, have my, I have my books there. And I also have future books that will be coming out as well. This is the first of at least a four book series. Oh, terrific. And then you'll come back in and talk to us. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Constance. It's thank been you. a pleasure. Thank you very much. This is Lori Creever signing off from our interview with Constance Natasha Mosier and her thoughts of an ordinary woman. I invite you to read a book. It could change your life. And let's encourage our children to do the same. Thank you.